guy's walking down the road one day and he falls in a hole. He shakes himself, gets up, starts to observe his surroundings, try to figure out where he is, but it's completely dark. He can't see where he is or what's going on. So he starts to feel the walls and thinks, well, maybe I can climb out of this hole. All I can see is the light from where I fell in. So he starts to grab and climb, but the dirt's loose and it keeps coming undone and it's wet and slippery. So he'll climb up a little bit and he'll fall back down. He climbs up a little bit and he falls back down. And after doing this for a long time, he finally decides I'm not gonna get out of this hole by myself. So he starts watching the light up at the top of the hole. And eventually a doctor walks by and he looks up and he says, Doc, Doc, can you help me out of here? I'm stuck in this hole. The doctor looks down, pulls out his prescription pad, writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole and walks on. A little while later, the guy looks up and he sees a professor. Prof, oh, finally, you're smart. Maybe you can help me figure out how to get out of this hole. Professor looks down the hole, examines the situation, pulls out a paper on the nature of holes and the geo geological makeup of the dirt in this area and the walls of the hole, and he throws the paper down in and he walks away. Man looks up, and a little while later, a pastor comes by. Oh, Reverend, thank God you're here. Surely you'll have some compassion on me and get me out of this hole. Pastor looks down the hole, contemplates for a minute, because you know that's what pastors do. <laughs> contemplates for a minute. Pulls out one of his best sermons, throws it down in the hole, walks away. The guy in the hole is about to give up hope. He's about done. He looks up and he sees a friend. Joe, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Can you help me get out of this hole? His friend looks down in the hole and he jumps right down in there with him. And the guy looks at his friend and goes, what are you doing? Now we're both in this hole. His friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before and I know the way out. Over the past few weeks, we've been hearing Peter write a letter to the, these new followers of Jesus who are spread out across the nations. And they're in the midst of trial and persecution. And yet Peter writes in this way that brings hope, that brings this picture of a better life, an abundant life. And I don't know about you, but as we've looked each week at what this life can look like, I've longed for it. I want that kind of life. I desire it. But if I'm honest, often, when I think about it, I don't always understand how I'm gonna get there. How do I live that type of life? You see, I know that oftentimes our trials and our persecutions perfect our faith. And yet I continually find myself asking, why, why is this happening, God? Can't you just fix this and make it better? There are times when leaders aren't living up to the expectations I have for them. And I'm trying to discern, do I submit? Do I speak truth to power? But if I'm honest, a lot of times my own desires and motivations get in the way of that discernment. There are times when I wanna live that peculiar life that the people of God are called to live. And I wanna be hospitable and be welcoming to all different kinds of people. And yet, I find myself hiding in my house with the people that I already like and not being opening, open and welcoming to the stranger. I desire this abundant life that God has to offer, but so often I find myself stuck in a hole and I don't know how to get out and I scratch and I claw and I try to climb, but I just keep falling back down. Maybe that's just me. So I'll preach to myself for a few minutes if that's okay. I think Peter expected us to ask this question because throughout the letter, he's been talking to the people as a whole. 
right? He hasn't been talking to anyone specifically. He's been talking to this group of Jesus followers who were spread out and who were in trial and persecution. But in this particular passage, he turns a corner and starts to talk to two specific groups of people. Did you notice it? He talks to the elders and he talks to those who are younger. And what he says to, to, to encourage us on the way to living this abundant life is about as simple as it comes. I read it and I read it again and I read it again and I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna have Jeff and Caleb sit here and read it like five times and we'll all go home. Just do, do that. But at the same time, I also know that if I took a poll of the people in this room and the people watching online, there aren't as many as we would hope who have had someone show them the way intentionally over time guide them, direct them, disciple them in the way that they should go. And there are probably even fewer who have accepted the role of elder and have said, I'm gonna jump down in the hole with somebody and show them the way out. And so I wrestled with what is it that changes that? What, what is it that leads us in that direction instead of keeping us stuck? And that's when I noticed that the passage doesn't end with those of you who are younger, acknowledge the authority of the elders. Peter actually turns a pretty sharp corner and I almost just wrote it off as, well, this goes with the next part. This isn't part of what he's saying here, but I think it is. He, the first thing he says is, when you relate to each other, clothe yourselves with what? Humility. Dress yourselves with humility. I love that picture. If there's anything that we need in our culture right now, it's to put on some humility. Am I right? It's so difficult for us. And I, I started to wonder, is it possible that Peter is challenging us with the idea that one of the greatest hurdles to discipleship is pride? What keeps me from being discipled well is my own pride. What keeps me from discipling others well is my pride. He says, when you relate to each other, elders, younger, all of you who are part of the body of Christ, dress yourselves with humility. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Transformation requires humility. And at just the right time, God will lift you up. So I thought, what if we look back at this simple system that Peter has given us in light of humility? So we're gonna work backwards now through the text because that's how my brain works, backwards. Those of you who are younger, accept the authority of the elders. Seems simple enough, right? I don't know that we often give this short statement the attention that it deserves. Over the past few years, um, I've had the privilege of becoming friends with a lot of people who are in recovery, um, people who are on that long, hard journey. And I've learned as much from them about discipleship uh, as I think I've learned anywhere else in the past couple of years, if I'm just real honest about it. And one of the things I've learned is about this particular idea of accepting the authority of the elders. If you're familiar with recovery at all, one of the first things I'm gonna do, uh, I, I'm gonna start my journey on recovery, so I'm gonna start attending meetings, right? Either an AA meeting or an NA meeting, and we're gonna gather together with like-minded people with a common goal aimed at freedom and hope and new life. Similar to what we try to do on Sunday mornings, right? The difference, one of the main differences is it's probably not just one person standing up talking the whole time. All of us are sharing our stories of our past hurts, of the things that we've overcome, of victories, of struggles, things that happened this week or 10 years ago. And it's a place of honesty and safety. And I start listening to the stories of other people in the room. And over time, as I hear those stories, I start to realize, wait, 
Nate's story is a little like my story. I hear a little bit about where he's been and that's the hole I'm in right now. He seems to have found his way out of that. And so I have to humble myself. And after one of the meetings, I have to walk up to him and I have to say, hey, I would really like it if you'd be my sponsor. Now, here's the part that I learned that kind of threw me for a loop. I would expect him to just say right away, great, let's start tomorrow. What he's probably gonna stay, say instead is, let me think about it. He might say, let me pray about it. Here, read this book, make this list of 100 things you're grateful for, make a list of four things that you wanna see change. Like, he's gonna give me this long list of things I need to do. And, and he'll say, do those things, come back, we'll talk, and then I'll decide if I'm gonna be your sponsor. <laughs> now, I've been in church a long time. And if somebody came to me and they said, hey, I want somebody to disciple me, I say, oh, I got the perfect person. Why don't you go talk to Nate? And that person goes and they talk to Nate and Nate says, you know, let me think about it. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go read the Old Testament. I want you to make, do, and he gives you five things to do. Go do those things, come back, and then I'll decide if I'm gonna disciple you or not. Chances are good, you're gonna come, you're gonna find me and you're gonna go, yeah, that guy's not gonna work. Do you see it? Peter is calling us to a discipleship that is humble, that accepts the authority of the elders, that says, I am one, I'm gonna humble myself and I'm gonna come and ask you for help because I've realized I can't get out of this hole by myself. But then I'm actually gonna pay attention and listen to you when you challenge me to change. That too takes humility. It requires me deciding I'm gonna be a part of that process. So often I, I met Christian after Christian who talks to me about being stuck in their discipleship. And we'll talk about kind of what they're doing and ultimately they kind of just come on Sunday morning and they sit and they expect one of us to stand up here and download a bunch of good information that will eventually transform their life. Maybe we'll sing a good enough song that my life will be changed. Maybe I'll go to a class or a small group and somebody there will say something that will eventually change my life. We need other people for that change, but at some point, if somebody's in the hole with us and they say, we're gonna show you the way out, I've gotta follow them. I have to go with them or I'm gonna stay stuck in my hole. takes humility to accept the authority of the elders. Now, while there are, aren't many of us who have probably experienced that type of discipleship, there are probably even fewer of us who have accepted the responsibility of being an elder for someone else. That too takes humility and it might take even more. When was the last time you shared your story in complete honesty in a room of people that maybe you know well, maybe you don't? The hurts, the past mistakes, the struggle, maybe even what I'm struggling with this week. Friends, we tend to like to keep those things hidden. Even the stuff that happened a long time ago. Because we're afraid of how it might make us look to other people who we want to earn their respect. And if I'm going to look down in that hole, if that guy doesn't know I've been there before, he might not ask me for help. Why would he? 
And I think time and time again, we gather together with the people of God and we make assumptions about the people on either side of us in the room. We look at their life. We think they've got it together. We fill in the blanks of what their life has looked like over time. And we say, they've not experienced the trouble I've experienced. They're not going to have anything to say. While at the same time, that person's looking at you thinking the exact same thing. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, I think this, they've adjusted this quotation a little bit. But basically he says, friendship begins when two people look at each other and they say, oh, you too? I thought I was the only one. The only way we can begin to bridge that gap is to share our story openly and honestly with people so that when someone realizes, wow, I am stuck in this situation, my discipleship is stuck, my growth is stuck, my life is stuck, but that person seems to have gotten through this type of thing before. Maybe they can help. To be willing to share my story that way takes humility. It takes honesty. And to shepherd well takes humility. N.T. Wright, when he was writing about this passage, he said, shepherds don't ask, how do I become a good shepherd? Shepherds ask, what do the sheep need? You see the difference? Let me put it out this way. Good parents don't say, how can my kids behave in a way that makes me look good? I run into pastor's kids all the time who, have, who are still trying to untangle that problem, right? I lived a life where I had to look good so my dad could look good or my mom could look good, and that messed me up, right? The parent says, what does my child need to flourish and grow and succeed? A good teacher doesn't say, how can I stand up and say things that make me sound smart or good or make students like me? A good teacher stands up and says, what is it that the students need to move from this point to the next point in their learning process? What do these students need to keep building toward their goal. A good employer doesn't say, what, do, what can that person do to make me more money? Or what can that person do to make my organization be better? A good employer says, what can I do for that person so that they can flourish and thrive and grow? And that's probably gonna help our company or our organization. You see the difference? And this is what Peter's calling us to. He's saying, elders, when you look at the people around you, don't ask, how can you be a good elder? Ask, what is it that these people need to live the abundant life that we're talking about, that Peter was talking about, that Paul is talking about in his letters, that Jesus talks about? What is it that people need to start to live that abundant life? And that takes humility on the part of the elder. When Peter starts to talk to the elders, did you notice what he said? He said, now I'm gonna to talk to you elders. I'm an elder too. And I'm a witness to the sufferings of Christ. I'm a witness, to, and that's what he focused on. And then later we'll experience the glory. But I'm a witness to the sufferings of Christ. Peter says to the elders, Friends, it's time to jump down in the hole and there are, going to be, there are going to be times that when you jump in the hole, you're going to experience the sufferings again. If you jump down in the hole with that person who needs your help, who needs your guidance, guess what? If they're in the dark, you're in the dark. If it's cold down there, you're cold. And humility doesn't drag people by the feet to the exit, right? That's what I want to do. If I'm going to help you out of that hole, I'm going to come down there. I'm going to drag you out. 
right? Kicking and screaming if I have to. That's not humility. Humility says we're gonna walk this journey together. I'm gonna show you the way out, but you're gonna have to take the steps. You're gonna have to walk it with me. Can't carry you out. I love the way the passage ends when it says, God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. And at just the right time, God will lift you up. Do you ever know that little kid on the playground? He's probably smaller than everybody else. Man, he was scrappy. And he liked to fight. Some of y'all probably were that kid. But some of those kids, they'd get into it and they had all the confidence, all the swagger in the world. Why? Because big brother was on the other side of the playground and he was huge, right? So that kid would get in a scrap and somebody else would start to fight him. And the next thing you know, the big brother's walking over, just standing behind him. Doesn't have to say anything, doesn't even have to do anything. He's just standing there. All of a sudden the fight breaks up. <laughs> kid, p- kids start walking away. I think there are times we assume that if we're gonna approach this life of discipleship, this life of walking the struggle with people, that we have to do it in this like fearful way or that we have to muster up the courage to win the fight ourselves. But the truth of the matter is God is walking up behind us. He's the one who wins the fight. Matter of fact, he probably defuses it. Fight never happens. At just the right time, God will lift you up. As I walk on the journey with someone else, I wait patiently and humbly for God to change their life. That's not my responsibility. So over the next week, maybe spend some time in quiet, listening, asking God, where am I stuck? So we talk about falling into a hole and sometimes we think of some rock bottom drastic experience. There are times throughout my journey that I just get stuck in my discipleship, in my growth, in my movement forward. And I need some help. So ask God to search your heart. Is there a place where I'm stuck? And if there is, who can help me? Humble yourself and ask them for help. Two, who is it that needs my experience? Who is it that I know that is stuck in the hole and they are calling me to help them? And am I gonna jump in the hole with them? Or am I gonna stand at the top throwing things down hoping they get out on their own.